So, good morning. Um, before I go on, there was an interesting question last, uh, after the lecture last time um, about this uh, softening effect. Hmm? So I just want to remind you of what uh, alloy softening is in steel. Hmm? Uh, if you plot uh, the yield strength, for instance, of, uh, of uh, ferritic steel as a function of the, the temperature, uh, you see uh, a very strong increase. And um, this um, increase takes off in the range of room temperature. So the room temperature, um, if you go below room temperature, you start seeing this increase in the, uh, the yield strength. And that is due to uh, so basically a strengthening effect, you know, because material becomes stronger. As, but it's very pronounced. For instance, if, if you would look at the same property yield strength as a function of the temperature for um, aluminum or for stainless steels, for that matter, uh, this would be much flatter. And the increase would be related to the, um, the temperature dependence of the elastic constants, basically. Um, so what happens here is we know that uh, we go to lower temperatures, the screw dislocations uh, start to become increasingly uh, uh, immobile. They, they, they're experiencing dif difficulty in moving, and that's because um, in order for them to move, they need to make kinks. You, know, you have to make the kinks, and the kinks have to move, yes? And, um, and that's becoming in increasingly difficult if uh, the kink formation is not assisted by uh, thermal activation. So, and, and thermal activation is uh, lower at lower temperature. So mm, as you know, uh, when you decrease the temperature in many steels, uh, you, um, you suddenly start to see that the material goes from a ductile behavior to a brittle behavior. And that is because um, as this yield strength increases, the, you may reach a stress level at which other things happen. The material, uh, the steel can cleave. Uh, for instance, or um, yeah, then cleave for, for reasons, um, uh, for many reasons for which steel could cleave, as be, for instance, um, because you've reached a cleavage stress, hmm? and cleavage stress is related, for instance, to twinning, etc. But let's not go into detail. There is a cleavage stress that may be reached if, uh, for instance, you have. Uh, weak grain boundaries, that cleavage stress may be related to um, the breaking of these, the grain boundaries. Hmm? Um, and, and you observe these things very uh, clearly in steels, exactly, precisely because this yield strength increases with temperature. Hmm? And you uh, probably already know that where you have this intersection, you get a uh, a transition from a ductile behavior on, on the higher temperature side to a brittle behavior below this temperature. And, and you know that this temperature is called a ductile to brittle transition temperature. Now what happens if, um, if, this, uh, if we alloy this uh, steel with, uh, for instance, silicon hmm, to strengthen it, or, or hmm, then what we see is that at room temperature, the material gets stronger. Yeah? But at lower temperature, the material gets, is weakened. It's not really weakened. The only thing that happens is when we alloy, we facilitate the formation 
of these double kinks. Hmm? That, that's basically, so that's why at low temperature the curve hangs low or than in the unalloyed case. And as a consequence uh, of this uh, softening, you may see a decrease in the ductile to brittle transformation temperature. Hmm? And there's one element uh, that, that does this very nicely and that, that's nickel. Hmm? nickel. And small additions of nickel, you will very often see, uh, are made in uh, applications where you use ferritic steels and where it's very critical to, uh, to have a low ductile to brittle transition temperature. Okay, so this was an interesting uh, 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 additional factor to this, this softening. So it's not necessarily always bad. Hmm? Uh, but, but you should be aware of this, uh, this effect. Hmm? Certainly, again, as I said, if you're considering, for instance, your work or your research um, applications which are low temperature applications. Hmm? All right, so, uh, but we had uh, arrived to the point of um, uh, strain hardening and I told you that the strain hardening was due to the interaction of dislocations on their glide plane cutting through a dislocation forests. Yeah? Now, these pinning points here yes, are obstacles that can be cut through. Yes? These are not permanent pinning points. Dislocations can cut through each other. Yes? And usually that leaves a, what we call a jog on the dislocations. And in certain cases, not all the cases, yes, of intersections, um, you will form sessile jogs. And they, they are very strong pinning points. Hmm? All right. We also uh, know that the, uh, the, the strengthening due to uh, these forest dislocations is proportional to the density of, of dislocations. Hmm? And if we assume that the dislocations are form a, a regular square pattern, hmm? yes, then they, they will be spaced uh, a distance one over the square root of the dislocation density. Um, and as a consequence, the, the, the law for the strain hardening gives me a, pro, a strength proportional to the dislocation density. Hmm? Okay? And uh, this would be like a general equation for the strain hardening. And you can see that um, you have a, a lattice strength, a solid solution strengthening factor. And then these factors alpha, G, and B are basically constants. Yes? So the only parameter, only variable here is the dislocation density. And, and the, this dislocation density is a function of strain. Hmm? So the dislocation density will increase with the strain. And some people have developed um, proportionality, uh, uh, relations between the dislocation density and the strain. Hmm? So, um, so when you measure a stress uh, a, a stress strain curve, yes, this is a stress strain curve here, yes, you see that the dislocation density increases. And typically, typically you go from 10 to the 11th to about 10 to the 15th uh, dislocations per square meters. Uh, it's, it may seem like a strange unit per square meters. But if you realize that the dislocation is a length, it means the dislocation density expressed as a length of dislocation per volume. Hmm? So if I have um, a unit volume, yes, like here. Hmm? So, um, so this is, for instance, one meter by one meter by one meter. Hmm? And I have a dislocation that goes right through this cube, yes, then the dislocation density is one meter of dislocation in one cube meter of volume, yes, so 
the dislocation density is in meters minus two. Mm -hmm. So that's a um, little bit an odd um, a quantity. The, um, now you can um, model, and it's in the book if you're interested in the details of the, the theory, uh, but you, so you can model this strain hardening mechanism nicely hmm? and, 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 and calculate stress strain curves based on this location density evolution. Hmm? And then you, you can also calculate as a consequence uh, the, uh, the strain hardening value. Hmm? And what you see, uh, the strain hardening is uh, uh, strain hardening in the meaning of the um, the exponent in the uh, Holomon equation. So you know that you can write um, stress is, um, is proportional to strain to a certain power. Yes, mm -hmm. that that's you call this the uh, uh, the strain hardening. That this n value, when in undergraduate uh, materials mechanics. They introduce this, they say, well, n is a constant. It isn't. Yes. Um, this, this n actually changes a lot during the, uh, the deformation. Hmm? Okay. And the reason is because of the changes in your dislocation density as you deform the material. Hmm? Right, so this is, for instance, a calculation of a stress-strain curve that's entirely... Uh, theoretical and where you can include for instance the, the effect of the the grain boundaries hmm? right and here there is some uh, text that's overlapping let me uh, see if I can correct this all right oops so you can read it uh, Right, so um, if you want to know what the yield strength is, yes, you you take the, the lattice friction times the the strengthening that was, for instance, taken into account here for um, manganese and and, and silicon uh, alloying. Okay, and these are some equations that have been published on the uh, the dislocation density variation with the strain. And these are experimental uh, multiplication rates for dislocations. So it's the dislocation density that basically gives me the, the strengthening in, in the, the, the flow strength. Now, dislocations themselves um, interact uh, with each other. Hmm? Uh, they interact with uh, the point defects and they, they will interact basically with other uh, and any other th thing that's on their way, on their glad path. And um, an obvious um, obstacles uh, are grain boundaries because they're there is a discontinuity in the in the crystal uh, in the um, the crystal structure. Basically, the crystal structure stops, and you cannot propagate these uh, dislocations across the grain boundary. So they tend to accumulate, yeah, and form uh, pileups. Hmm? Now, the, the way you have to see the creation of a pileup is is as follows. So say this is a grain boundary here, hmm? and, and this is a glide plane. Hmm? This is a grain boundary, and this is a glide plane. So here I create, for instance, there is a source of dislocations, yes? Dislocation source that emits dislocations, hmm? loops of dislocations, yes? And uh, these dislocations, um, so here you have successive dislocations. They arrive at this at this grain boundary, yeah, okay. And um, so say this this location is stuck there, okay. The this the next dislocation that follows it is 
exactly the same dislocation on the same glide plane. Yes, same Burgers vector, same Burgers vector, same um, glide plane. So they exert a very strong repulsive interaction on each other. So there is a repulsion. Repulsion. And the more dislocations I add, the stronger this repulsion is. Yes? If the grain boundary was not there, the dislocation loop would expand you know, till the dislocation would exit the crystal. In this case, they, they can't do this. They're just stuck at the grain boundary. So in order to uh, create plastic deformation, I have to constantly increase the stress, the ex externally applied stress, to push these dislocations against closer and closer to the grain boundary. So one of the things you, s you see if, if you look, for instance, the microscope, is that the more dislocations you have, the further apart they are. Yes, and that is a, a, and you can see here, for instance, you see it very nicely here. You can see how the dislocations are closely spaced to, at the boundary and then further and further apart. It's an expression of the fact that uh, you built up a stress here at the grain boundary, hmm, which um, uh, pushes back the, the dislocations that are arriving at the grain boundary. Hmm. So you get stress concentrations at the grain boundaries. Hmm. And the smaller your grain is, if the grain is very small, yes, then my loop is these, these uh, loops, uh, dislocation loops, um, uh, you don't have to need to have many dislocation loops before you reach uh, this situation. Yeah? So the smaller the grain size, the harder your applied stress must be hmm, to have plastic deformation of the grain because the uh, dislocations are stuck at the grain boundary. Hmm? And, uh, and, and, and uh, this is a real effect, it's a very strong effect, these grain boundaries. So what happens is um, the different theories, actually, uh, for uh, grain boundary strengthening, yes? Um, and um, so, so one of the theories um, gives you a, gives this whole patch equation that you all know that the stress um, is proportional to one over the square root of the grain size. And this is the theoretical form of this um, uh, uh, relation. So what you see again is I, you see a number of constants like alpha, g, b, pi, d is the, the, the grain diameter, yes? and one minus the Poisson ratio. So the only, the big parameter here is the critical shear stress to activate a dislocation source. Uh, what is that? It, well, uh, one of these theories says that uh, you will uh, propagate, you will, you will have a flow uh, in the crystal, in the, in the polycrystal, because um, this uh, uh, stress concentration you get at a uh, at the uh, the grain boundaries will result in the this stress uh, activating a dislocation source in a neighboring grain. Yes. So, okay. So that's the only parameter. Now, again, as I said, there different theories and um, in this case for instance um, there's no um, the the, the, uh, the properties of the the grain boundaries do not appear there are no there are no obvious parameters related to the grain boundary itself yeah. there are the theories 
that say, well, the effect you get is actually related to the grain boundaries. And that um, what happens is that as you have this very high stress accumulation at this grain boundary, there comes a moment where the grain starts emitting dislocations. And the reason why um, these alternative theories uh, are, uh, have been proposed, and the reason why we mention it here is because, because they appear to apply for, for uh, steels, hmm? is, is the following. If you look at the um, um, Hall patch equation, yes, what you basically are plotting in, the, in this curve, what you need to, to plot uh, is you, you measure yield strengths in samples where you have different grain sizes, yes? And that is very, uh, very simple. Hmm? Uh, so here you have the grain size, one over the square root of the grain size. And so this is what the Hall patch equation predicts. It's very interesting because uh, this would be yield strength beta as a function of the grain size. This point here is the yield strength for a infinite grain size. Yes, for a sample without grain boundaries. Right? Okay. Now, in according to this theory here, yes, there is the only parameter here is the the, the, the stress that's needed to activate a, a dislocation source. Yes? There are no properties related to the uh, composition or to the, uh, the grain boundary itself. Well, it turns out that what happens is when we have very, uh, in steels, when we increase the carbon content in the steel, yeah? you go from zero to 30 ppm to 60 ppm, Instead of having something like this, for instance, where the slope is the same, yes, but you increase the yield strength because, the, because of carbon strengthening, yes, what you see is that instead is that is you get this. that all these points come together and that the, the slope increases as I increase the carbon content. Yeah? And one of the ways in which uh, people have tried to explain this is that when we add that, uh, uh, that the, the effect of the strength and the grain strengthening is due to grain boundary properties and in particular grains, grain boundary emitting dislocations rather than the bulk grains uh, creating dislocation loops. And so uh, the idea is that as you add carbon, yes, the carbon goes to the grain boundaries and strengthens the grain boundaries and makes it more difficult for grain boundaries to emit dislocations. And that's where this, the actual strengthening comes from. And again, there are theories um, uh, have been developed on this basis, yes, and and they also give a one over square root d proportionality. So that makes it kind of difficult to check which theory is actually uh, correct. Hmm? Um, right, but um, and, and we we know that when you add carbon in ferritic steels, at certainly low uh, uh, amounts of carbon the carbon solubility is extremely low, you remember? At room temperature, probably zero. So the carbon will have a tendency to move to grain boundaries, yes? And to uh, dislocations, so in general. Uh, when it does this, in particular when it moves to grain boundaries, it strengthens the cohesion of the grain boundaries. We know this, yes? We know that it does this if the carbon content is low enough so that, so that you don't form grain boundary carbides, grain boundary cementite. Because as soon as you form uh, grain boundary cementite, 
you know, you get um, unbrittling effects resulting from the presence of these cementites uh, at the grain boundary. Anyway, so uh, here you go. Uh, some, some, uh, some data in general. Uh, this whole patch uh, slope is uh, uh, very um, well uh, clearly seen in, in many steels and iron alloys. Um, if um, uh, w one of the things you see if you have IF steels which do not contain uh, carbon this this slope is very low hmm? this slope is very low a again um, uh, a sign that uh, grain boundary strengthening may may play a role in the um, in, in this um, uh, strengthening grain boundary strengthening mechanism very low um, and um, so you can see here for IF steel, it's almost the same as for pure iron, the, uh, the slope of the uh, hull patch curve. When you add elements, yes, um, you see different things happening. In particular with the phosphorus, low levels of phosphorus um, will, will, give, will increase the slope, then uh, high levels of phosphorus, the slope decreases again. So, um, uh, the message here is when you are trying to evaluate the effect of a um, uh, or calculate the effect of the, um, the whole patch effect by um, calculation, yes, always watch out for you know, what is the composition of my alloy because you cannot just take a literature data yes, and apply it. There's a lot of uh, literature data, here's an example here of whole patch um, KY parameters, yes, for different alloys, alpha iron, uh, mainly ferritic alloys, martensitic alloys, austenitic alloys, and you can see that uh, in particular for the, uh, the, the, the ferrite, you see a very wide variation, yes, so, okay, Uh, and this is an error here. This should be micron. So perhaps if you um, if you have a, a copy of the slides, please. Uh, the this here is microns, micrometers. Okay. So uh, yes. So. so um, if you use a value of 5 or you use a value of, uh, of uh, 27, it makes a very big difference in your, uh, um, you know, if you're calculating the strength. So very important here. Um, well, the message is that certainly if you're in research, uh, well, try to determine the KY factor yourself. If, if, you, if you can't change the grain size too much, um, then, uh, you know, make sure the composition uh, you pick the uh, KY value from, from literature for instance, is very close to the composition you're using. Hmm? Um, right, and if you look into a, um, a, a steels themselves, yeah? these were kind of a wide variety of um, you know, um, materials here. But if you look at, at steels, for instance, that are used in um, automotive applications, hmm, such as uh, commercial quality steel, high strength steel, refos steels, and, and uh, prolytic steels, you in general see you know, values 10 to 20 uh, megapascal per uh, time square root of uh, millimeters. Hmm? So that's the kind of values that you should be using if you're working in, in, in steels. Hmm? The um, whole patch equation uh, holds uh, not only for the yield strength but also for the tensile strength, yes? Um, for the tensile strength. Hmm? And, um, well, we'll come back to uh, what the implication is of, of this, um, the, the difference. But, um, the, uh, the fact that you can get 
uh, quite a lot of strengthening uh, just by reducing the grain size is of course very interesting from a technological point of view because the, the grain size is controlled by processing um, and, um, and so we will, we will try to get in steels an optimal grain size yeah? and the, the way this is done is um, by adding precipitates to uh, our steels yes um, and um, the reason why uh, precipitates in the steel uh, allow for grain boundary um, uh, grain size control is because um, grain boundaries will have a tendency to uh, move in such a way to increase the grain size yeah? and um, but when it encounters a particle, yes, uh, part of the surface of the, the grain boundary is replaced by, disappears basically, yeah, and is replaced by this uh, contact line, yes. Now, um, And this, if this is a uh, low energy uh, contact, hmm, the, the grain boundary, uh, who for instance wants to move from left to right here, yes, wants to move from left to right, will be retained by the precipitate. Hmm, because I have replaced uh, part of the, the surface of the, the grain boundary by this interface, hmm? interfacial contact layer. Hmm? So, um, so, so the, the particle can exert a, uh, uh, a dragging force on the growth of, uh, on the moving grain boundaries. Hmm? And for instance, here you can see here, uh, you have two grains. This grain obviously bulges out, yes, into this grain. But you can see here that at this particle, yes, the, this, the, you know, the, the, the contact zone here uh, retains, exerts a dragging force on this, uh, this grain boundary that wants to, to move to the right. Hmm? Yeah? And there is a very simple law yes, uh, that relates the, uh, uh, the, uh, the size yeah. This the ma the maximum stable grain size, yes, that you can have in a material when in the presence of precipitates with a radius r and a volume fraction f. And the so if I rewrite this equation, uh, Zener equation tell me that this maximum grain size yes divided by the radius of the precipitate yes this is proportional to four thirds one over the um, uh, volume fraction of the precipitate yeah? so it's very simple yeah it's very simple law and um, so if I plot this in a log of this parameter uh, times log of this parameter, so this would give me log of this plus log of that factor, yes, hmm. I will get a straight line, so log of, this is a log scale, of d over r versus log of the volume fraction of precipitates, yes. I see I should get this line with a slope of minus one. All right. Now the, the actual, in practice, it turns out that this factor four thirds, yes, uh, is actually 1.7, is point 0.17, yes, 
0.17 in practice. Yes. But that you, you do get this nice uh, linear relation between uh, the, this ratio of the grain size diameter of precipitate uh, radius as a function of the log of the precipitate fraction. And typically, yeah, typically precipitates are added in steels in the range of 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4 in volume fraction. Yes? And if we have a precipitate with a radius of say five nanometers, yes, then depending on the, the volume fraction, our grain size can be controlled from five micron to about a half a micron, according to this equation. So um, very often the um, uh, uh, strengthening mechanisms, the materials are presented uh, uh, with, um, particularly with uh, the um, discussion of uh, particle strengthening, yes? Uh, and it's always uh, forgotten that at the same time you do particle strengthening, you also control the grain size. Yes? In fact, in, uh, in HSLS steels, in conventional HSLS steel, these niobium HLS steels, the, the strengthening doesn't actually come from the precipitation, but most of it comes from grain size reduction hmm? through this um, uh, grain boundary pinning mechanism. Hmm? Now, can we go on forever reducing the uh, uh, the, uh, the grain size, yes? No, we cannot because as you, if you plot the yield strength as a function of the, uh, the grain size, you, um, you find something like uh, like this, huh? and uh, if you uh, plot the tensile strength, I sh I sh this is funny. Okay, this is uh, not correct. Oh, this is interesting. Right, so this is the tensile strength. Yeah. And this is the yield strength. Just notice this, yes. Um, so the yield strength increases as the uh, grain size uh, decreases, yeah? decreasing grain size. And so does the tensile strength. However, the slope, the slope here of the tensile strength, yes, the whole patch slope, is lower. If, if we go back a few slides, you can see here... Uh, a whole type equation for tensile strength, in general, we see lower values, yes? Let's see, for, yeah, you see here, the same values for, here I have 10, yes? Here the values are lower, yes? So the, you get a, um, a slope. So if I have, um, large grain size, the yield strength is here, and the tensile strength is there, obviously. And if I reduce the grain size, the yield strength increases, the tensile strength increases also, but at a lower slope, yes? So eventually they, they, got, they kind of have to meet up, yes? Mm -hmm. and, and when that happens, uh, when that happens, so, if I would make a plot here of uh, stress and strain, yes? The yield strength and the tensile strength is here, yes? Uh, if the yield strength comes next to the tensile strength, there is no elongation anymore, right? The material just yields and uh, 
necks and breaks. So, um, and, and this happens at around one micron in grain size. So you cannot limitlessly reduce the grain size. At one point, it becomes pointless because you kill, you, know, you destroy the ability of the material to plastically deform. And the reason, the, the profound reason why, uh, why this happened is because at small grain sizes, the standard ways in which we create dislocations and we accumulate dislocation in, uh, in materials are, is altered. You don't have uh, classical uh, behavior. Okay. Um, so small particles can be added to control the grain size. Hmm? Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering what, what's kind of the uh, technical limit for, for grain size control, probably five micron. You, you know, can be produced industrially on large scales. Precipitation strengthening, yes, um, in steels. Um, in principle, you can have particles um, inserted in the lattice, yes, and these uh, particles can interact with dislocation by being sheared by the, the dislocation. So the dislocation just passes through the particle. But in steels, we, we don't get this mechanism. Most of the time, we have larger incoherent part precipitates, and we get what's called the Orowan bypassing mechanism, which, which gives us the strengthening. Hmm? Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, uh, these, uh, uh, this cutting of uh, particles happens when you have coherent precipitates, because the dislocation has to pass through the particle, yes, and, and usually you need to have very small particles also. Hmm? All right. Uh, the difference uh, between the two also is that after the passage of the dislocation, uh, in the first case we have a sheared particle, in the other case we have a dislocation loop around the uh, the the particle, hmm? and if we if you remember that um, dislocations strengthening comes from dislocations interacting with obstacles, when we have this kind of uh, uh, strengthening, this uh, particle looping uh, mechanism, the dislocation bow, bows out between the particles so that the, the, this angle phi, phi over two, yes, uh, becomes zero, yes? You have, basically, the particle doesn't let go of the dislocation, yeah? And the reason why the dislocation does pass the uh, the, the precipitates is because if I have a dislocation here, yes, and it's stuck at these um, particles, yes, if I, <clears throat> if I look, so this is, will be a side view, yes, if I look at this part of the dislocation and this part of the dislocation, yes? Hmm? What I see, what I will see, is that their uh, Burgers factor is the same because it's the same dislocation. Yeah? But the uh, line direction is different. So the, the line goes in this direction, uh, goes towards me on the left, and goes away from me on the right. So uh, it basically means that on the left side of the particle, my dislocation core structure looks like this, and on the right-hand side, my dislocation core structure looks like that. Yeah? So, so what happens? I have two dislocations yes, on the same glide plane, with a B, one has a, a B as a Bergs factor, the other one has a minus B. They will 
attract each other. They will attract each other, yes? And uh, so these two dislocations will annihilate and form basically a full uh, normal lattice. And that's the reason why the dislocation can pass these, uh, these particles but they leave behind a dislocation loop that gets pinched off. Now, in the case, in this particular case, the, uh, the strengthening, yes, the strengthening um, is a function of the precipitate radius, yes? And the um, uh, relationship is this one. So the strengthening, the strengthening is proportional to G, the shear modulus, B, the Burgess vectors of the dislocation, times square root of the uh, volume fraction of precipitate divided by the ratio of these precipitates. So the uh, smaller I make my precipitates, the higher, yes, the, uh, uh, the strengthening. Hmm? And the larger I make the volume fraction, yes, so if I increase the volume fraction, if I increase the volume fraction, this line will move upward. Hmm? This is for an increasing value of A, F, excuse me. Okay. And it's very different from the case where you have a particle shearing. There, the, this R, the radius of the particle, is not in the denominator, but the strengthening is proportional to the square root of F times R. So in this case, uh, the strength increases with particle size. But as again, as I said, in steels, this is the kind of strengthening that, that, we, uh, that we are dealing with. Yeah? Because this, the particle strengthening that we're dealing with is due to the presence of very hard carbides, yes? With very different uh, lattice parameters than the surrounding ferrite, yes? And, uh, and on top of that, very different uh, elastic uh, properties. So the dislocation just cannot, um, dislocation in the ferrite cannot, or in the austenite, uh, cannot pass these particles. They are impenetrable obstacles. So this is an, an example here hmm, where you see a dislocation and here a carbide uh, precipitate. Yeah? So you see some interaction here. The dislocation here is pinned, yes. Um, you can see here the buildup of uh, dislocations at the, uh, at the particle. Mm -hmm. And when a few of these particles have passed, uh, a few of these dislocations have passed uh, this type of particle, you can see they're surrounded with dislocation loops. Okay? So this... Um, um, all right. So the... Uh, theory, uh, again, is uh, available. We won't go into the, the details of the derivation of this theory. Hmm? But uh, the, the, the difference between, again, with, between shearable particles, if you're wondering where the square root, why, why, why does it come that the square root is in the denominator, um, in one case, the other one not, it's basically due to the fact that when you have these shearable particles, yes, um, you have a very much larger um, uh, angle phi over two. So it's much easier for the dislocation to move through the particle. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the, the, the obstacle, the particle, let's, let's go of the dislocation at much lower uh, critical angles phi over two. Whereas in the case of the looping mechanism, this, uh, the, the, um, the pinning is very efficient, yes? And this angle phi over two, when the, the, the dislocation passes through, the, um, uh, passes the, 
the obstacles, these hard particles, phi over 2 is, is 0, effectively. So, um, the precipitation strengthening uh, theory gives you uh, this kind of equation. If you, uh, you're interested in using uh, uh, theory to, um, to predict what kind of strengthening you get in, in for instance, experimental steel, this is a, a good formula to use here, where uh, sigma p is the, uh, the strengthening effect of, a, of precipitates with a diameter dp hmm, and a volume fraction f. And if you apply this equation, for instance, to uh, HSLA steels, this is what you get. So you, this is the increase in the yield strength as a function of the, uh, the size. And the size decreases from left to right. Hmm? So you get a very strong increase in the strength. Hmm? And um, as you increase the volume fraction of the particles, you also get an increase in strength. Hmm? And you can present uh, this equation. So that's, uh, excuse me, that's this equation here. Uh, also, as increase in yield strength as a function of the precipitate fraction. Yes? Four different radii of the um, sizes of the uh, precipitates. Now, um, typical values are 5 to 10 nanometers, yeah. mm. Mm. 5 nanometers mm. uh, particles. We can see that if your uh, volume fraction is 10 to the, the third, yes, minus 3, excuse me, 10 to minus 3, the, the strengthening will be about 100 megapascal, yes? Usually, um, you don't get as much, yes? Usually, it's, it's, on, it's of the order of 50 to 100 megapascal, what you get. Hmm? Are there systems um, where we do, uh, where we strengthen steels using precipitation hardening and we don't have the Oro-1 looping mechanism, yes. Um, you can harden uh, steels, ferritic steels, with copper, yes, and get very tiny, uh, coherent precipitates of copper in your iron matrix, yes. Um, so here you have this, uh, uh, you can see here a grain, it's, it's in TM, you, very small particles are present in the ferrite matrix. This is copper. Yes. How is it brought in? This copper, uh, well, what you have typically in these steels, this is the phase diagram, is, is the following phase diagram, the iron copper phase diagram. The range of copper addition is um, point, uh, 0.75 to 1.5, that's the range of copper additions that you have. What you start off with is doing a solution treatment. That means you heat the steel up to here, 850. That brings you in this alpha stability domain. You see the, the copper is fully dissolved in the, uh, in the ferrite. And then you quench the material. And when you do this, the copper is in supersaturated solution. And a reheating to 500 degree C uh, results in very small uh, copper precipitates. Yes? If you uh, heat a uh, higher temperature or for a longer time, you will get coarsening. Yes? Um, so, but at 500, uh, you can get what is called an age hardening uh, steel, uh, where the, the hardening is through these uh, copper uh, particles. Hmm? Okay, and if you look at the uh, contributions uh, to the uh, strength, yes, uh, 
you see first of all that as you add copper, yes, um, a steel, yes, uh, uh, with copper can be uh, very very much strengthened by this copper addition. Yeah? And there are uh, the, um, the effect, there's multiple effects. So if, if this is the, the basic uh, strength of ferrite would be at around 100, yes? Then you have a grain size strengthening effect due to the, uh, the copper additions, copper particles addition, yes? Uh, copper is also a very uh, good solid solution strengthener, right? So you get a, a solid solution contribution and then a precipitation hardening effect. And you, you can see the precipitation hardening effect is uh, considerable. Okay. But in general, what, we're, uh, what we have are uh, these uh, nitrides or carbides of micro-alloying elements such as niobium, titanium, and, and uh, uh, vanadium. Hmm? The, uh, it's very important to control the size of these precipitates. For instance, in this uh, uh, picture here, uh, these particles here are too large yes, to give any strengthening. Yes? Uh, you need particles that are of the order of five to 10 nanometers, yes? So any particle that is, because of the, um, the fact that R is in the denominator, yes, any uh, larger particles will give you very low strengthening effects. Yes? So the, it's important to control precipitation if you want uh, size of precipitates, if you want any uh, strengthening effect. Hmm? So, um, with, in, in general, hmm, um, if you have um, small niobium uh, carbide precipitates, um, the um, you can look at the, uh, the, the main parameter that's, that will influence the, uh, uh, the strength, yes, will be the, the volume fraction. Mm -hmm. And, um, or uh, if, you, uh, if you can change the density of niobium particles, yes, uh, that are the same size, then the, the main part, uh, parameter is the interparticle distance. Yeah? So if I have particles with the same size, say that ideal five nanometer uh, size, yes, then a, uh, a, re a reduction hmm, in the interparticle distance, yes, this is a reduction in interparticle distance, yes, basically means that I have more particles or a higher volume fraction, yes? You will see that there is a linear relation now between the strength, yes, and the inverse of the interparticle spacing, hmm? okay? But that is basically another way of saying that, you know, when you increase the, the volume fraction at a, um, volume fraction at the constant R, yes, you will have uh, this, uh, an increase in the, in the strength. Hmm? Okay, so, just a second here, yeah. So before we, uh, we go into multi-phase materials, yes, um, I want to say that the yield strength of a steel, yes, is temperature dependent. Yes, and we are usually, so, so you get, and, and the dependence looks like this, at very high temperatures, uh, I get low strength, and then I get a, a kind of a plateau where the strength is temperature independent, and then around room temperature, I get a rapid increase in 
depending on, so if I, I, if I decrease the temperature, I get a rapid increase in the, in the temperature dependence. Yeah? Now, the level of this strength here, yes, depends on, well, the strengthening effects that I have added, right? So I will have the basic lattice strength, which is low for iron, yes? Then I will have my solutes, yes? Solid solution strengthening, yeah? Will contribute to this room temperature strength, yeah? And then my dislocation, uh, dislocation, my strain hardening will also, yeah? So they all um, contribute to the, the strength in this plateau, yes? This, the, <coughs> excuse me, this increase here, yes, is related, as you know, to the double kink nucleation, yes? Becoming harder because the double kink nucleation is thermally activated. Hmm? That's why we get an increase here. Hmm? And uh, at higher temperatures, yes, uh, I get, yeah, oh, before I say, um, so this plateau here uh, is, is an temperature independent, yes, we say, there is a slight temperature dependence which comes from the temperature dependence of the uh, elastic modulus properties, like the shear modulus, the Young's modulus. So there is a little uh, downward slope. Um, above 600 degrees C, uh, what we see is that the properties become, uh, are related to creep, yes? Um, so, uh, at low temperature, it's important to realize so that we are dealing with short-range interactions. Here, we deal with longer-range interactions between dislocations and impurities. But it's important that you, you are aware of the fact that there is a, a temperature dependence to the properties. Now, most of our steels, they're not purely ferrite. They are, um, uh, they consist, they're multi-phase, yes? And for instance, if you look at the pearlitic steel, this is a purely pearlitic steel, um, we have these lats, lamellas of uh, ferrite alternating with cementite lamellas. And we can define um, uh, islands, yes, of parallel lamellas, yes, which we call perlite colonies, yes, we can uh, give them a size just the way we give them a, uh, give a size to uh, grains and we can also define another uh, structural parameter and that's the interlamellar spacing. Hmm? The um, uh, interlamellar spacing hmm, it has a very pronounced effect on the, on the, on the strength. And in fact, you have a Hall patch like relation between the, the strength of the perlite and the inverse of the square root of the interlamellar spacing. Hmm? And this holds for most of the um, <coughs> uh, perlitic steels. Um, so the reason why in this particular case you have, uh, so, so this is a fully perlitic steel, that means it has 0.8% uh, of carbon, yes? Why, why the 1.5 and 1.8% carbon steels give me this equation? Well, that's very simple, that's because there's more carbon too, yes? More carbon means there's more uh, perlite in the, excuse me, more cementite in the perlite and that gives me this higher strength. Hmm? So this, this is just a reflection. But in terms of, of slope, it's very, very similar. Now, the perlite itself, what is the perlite? The perlite is a composite, yeah? It's a composite material, yeah? And um, uh, cementite has a um, extremely high strength, yes? In fact, extremely high yield strength, close to th probably 3,000 uh, megapascal, yeah? Uh, whereas the, the ferrite that surrounds it is a much lower strength material. So these would be, in comparison, the stress-strain curve for your cementite and your ferrite. 
Yeah? The stress strain curve of your lamellar perlite is somewhere in between, yes? In such a way that yeah, at any point on the stress strain curve of this lamellar perlite, I have stress and strain partitioning. That means that the two phases are not subjected to the stress and the strain of the, uh, uh, the perlite, but they have very different stresses and strain. In particular, the very strong phase yeah, picks up most of the stress and undergoes very little deformation. And the reverse is true for the soft phase, yes, which picks up most of the strain, the deformation, and very and, and much less stress. Yeah. Where the curve lies for lamellar perlite, yes, depends on the relative amount of each phase. Hmm? If I have more cementite, yeah, more cementite, so more theta carbide, yeah, more cementite, this curve will go upward. Hmm? Okay. In the case of martensite, yes, um, the situation is more complex because martensite is a constituent, it's basically ferrite, with a carbon in supersaturation. It contains lots of so-called transformation dislocations and the units, the structural unit in the martensite is what's called a lath, yes? And that's very small, yeah? But the most important uh, parameter influencing the strength of the martensite is the carbon content, yeah? And there have been uh, uh, different um, uh, equations proposed for the strength of martensite, yeah? But in general, what people report is a very strong uh, relation between the strengthening and the carbon content. I show you these uh, uh, equations here, they're experimentally measured, so you I mean, definitely don't learn them by heart, but the interesting thing is that you can see that also here, yeah, um, uh, it's unclear to the researchers what the exponent is of the carbon content yes, uh, that you should use to express the relation between carbon content and solid solution strengthening. In fact, and you see the reason here, is here you have two, uh, two of these relations, the yield strength as a function of carbon content. One of them has the uh, yield strength being proportional to the carbon content, and the other one has the yield strength being proportional to the square root of the carbon content. And you can see that over a range that's technically very important from about 0.02% uh, to about 0.2% uh, here, um, these two functions are basically the same. You can't tell them apart. Hmm? Um, yes. Um, so carbon is the, the most important uh, parameter. And um, you see here that uh, as the, the carbon content decreases, martensite becomes very soft, yes? So, so uh, martensite itself is not intrinsically a hard, brittle phase, yeah? The, the fact that it's very hard and very brittle and very strong is because of the carbon in solid solution. Hmm? Martensite hmm? Uh, sometimes will contain carbide particles when you tempered it. Yeah? When you temper it, the, um, the carbide particles can contribute to the strength, yes? as carbide particles. 
And here, uh, uh, the, you see the relation between the yield strength of martensite and the reciprocal of the mean planar distance between carbide particles in tempered martensite. You know that when you, when you go from martensite to tempered martensite, you take the carbon out of solution and replace it by, with carbide particles in the lattice, right? And you see the same thing as what we just showed for these niobium carbide precipitates. If you look at the, uh, the, the distance between the particles and you, you do one over the distance, so that means more, uh, more, more carbide particles going this way, you get a strengthening effect due to um, high volume fraction of, of carbide uh, particles. And at that moment, yes, uh, the martensite looks very much like bainite because bainite is really st structurally very similar to, uh, uh, to martensite in terms of dislocation density, in terms of carbide densities, in terms of uh, structural size of the structural units. Hmm? Okay, so here you can see uh, bainite hmm? and martensite data, but now we look at the strengthening effect of the lat size. Yes, the lat size. And here you see that both in the case of bainite and in the case of tempered martensite, the lat size also plays a role, yes? Uh, and why would the lat side play a role? Yes, um, because so in uh, martensite you have lats, in bainite you have these uh, structural units. Yes, so the the width of these uh, lats basically defines how far dislocations can slip before they are held up by the, bound, the lat boundaries. Hmm? Hmm? And so you get um, the, the strengthening effect when the lat size is smaller. So this is one over the lat size, so it goes um, smaller lat sizes give me, excuse me, smaller lat sizes give me higher strength. So this is high lat, large lats, smaller lats, more strength. Hmm? Now, what is important here is that um, most people have reported not a square root dependence of the lat size, but a reciprocal dependence on the lat size. This is probably due to the fact that uh, the normal hull patch relationship breaks down when the grain size, when the unit size, structural unit size becomes very small. Because in this case, uh, the, the lat sizes, yes, are submicron size. Yes, submicron size, and, and it's just like with dislocation uh, mechanism, storage mechanism are breaking down when you have very small grain sizes. The hull patch equation also breaks down at smaller uh, grain sizes. Right, so, well, I think it's a good moment to, uh, to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say a few things on, uh, on Wednesday about uh, general uh, mechanics things that I want you to, to remember, and then we'll move on to um, seeing how we make uh, products uh, with specific uh, properties with you know, the knowledge we have gathered up to now. Okay, thank you for your attention.